Before I introduce our panellists here today, I'd just like to say a few words of introduction to the exhibition um, to describe the content a little bit. This exhibition, Transformations, Early Bark Paintings from Arnhem Land, draws upon two key cultural collections. Um, and the first of which is the Donald Thompson Collection, which is under the joint custodianship of the University of Melbourne and Museum Victoria. And the second is the Leonard Adam Collection of International Indigenous Culture, which is one of the university's very treasured um, cultural collections. Today's discussion, however, focuses on the Yongu paintings in this exhibition and specifically on the body painting designs, the sacred clan designs that a lot of these works embody. Um, and the significance of these particular works, aside obviously from their staggering aesthetic presence, um, is due to the fact that these are the earliest in existence um, that depict these sacred Madain Minchi designs from clans in North Eastern and Central Arnhem Land. Um, they were made by clan leaders and others with ritual authority for the anthropologist Professor Donald Thompson in 1935 to 37 and also again in 1942. And they were made specifically for the purposes of educating European Australians about the relevance and complexity of Yongu culture. Um, so engagement was really a very clear objective um, for producing these works and I think it's fair to say that this remains true for the Yongu contemporary art that's made today. So I'd like to begin by introducing Wanubi Marika, um, who's a respected Riratingu clan leader mm. um, and an esteemed artist as well. Wanubi's father was one of the key plaintiffs in Australia's first land rights case, <coughs> which is the Gove's land, Gove land rights case. And Wanubi has trained as a primary school teacher. He has an associate diploma of community management and has many official responsibilities associated with his land and the Yurikala community in Arnhem Land, mm. uh, including being the founder of the Yurikala Ranges, which administers a vast area of protected land. And for many years until 2011, Wanubi was the uh, Buku Lange Mulka Artist Community Chairperson, so the Art Centre Chairperson for many years. Wanubi began painting in the late 1990s um, when he made work for the important exhibition Saltwater, Yakala Buck Paintings of Sea Country, which toured around Australia and is now in the collection of the National Maritime Museum in Sydney. Mm. In 2004, he held his first solo exhibition and since then his work has been exhibited many times in Australia but also in Paris and Switzerland. And in 2012 he was one of the artists featured on the ABC's Art and Soul program. So Wanubi, thank you mm. for being here and welcome. Secondly, Professor Howard Morphy uh, is Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Research School of Humanities and the Arts at the Australian National University in Canberra. Howard has written extensively on Aboriginal art and in particular Yongu art and culture of which his two books Ancestral Connections published in 1991 and more recently Becoming Art Exploring Cross-Cultural Categories published in 2007 are widely recognised as the primary publications on Yongu art. Uh, needless to say Howard has spent a lot of time with Yongu throughout, throughout his career and with his wife Frances Morphy he developed Yongu he helped Yongu prepare the Blue Mud Bay native title claim, which in 2008 recognised ownership of the waters of the intertidal zone under the Northern Territory Land Rights Act, a monumental achievement. Uh, lastly is my colleague, Lindy Allen, um, from Museum Victoria. Lindy is Senior Curator for Northern Australian Collections at Museum Victoria, and aside from her other duties as curator for a vast collection of objects at the museum, Lindy has had much of the responsibility over the last 20 years for the custodianship of the Donald Thompson Collection, um, and she's worked directly with Yongu to research and establish appropriate protocols for the care of this invaluable collection. Lindy's published widely on material culture, art and history, the representation of Indigenous people in museums, and the practice of collecting, one of the major outcomes of an Australia Research Council grant was the publication The Makers and Making of Indigenous 
Australian Museum collections. Uh, Lindy has curated over 30 exhibitions and the most recent of which was Ancestral Power and the Aesthetic, um, which might be familiar to many of you, which was held here at the Potter in 2009 and toured nationally. And I would also like to acknowledge Lindy's ever-present spirit of generosity in um, helping the Potter to bring together this exhibition today. So, um, yes, thanks, Lindy, and welcome. Thanks for being here. <coughs> So, um, there's a lot to cover today. It's very complex and um, dense ground. And before we talk to Wanubi about these magnificent paintings, um, I'd like to ask Howard and Lindy to provide a bit of background to the historical context of these works, um, to clarify some key aspects that I think are really important to understanding their significance. Howard, can I start by asking you to talk about the Yongwu Bark painting tradition? Um, because as I said, these works are some of the earliest in existence, um, but obviously Yongwu did paint on barks prior to Thompson visiting, and it would be good yep. to hear yep. about that. Yep. Thank you. Yep. 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 Um, well, I'd um, like to thank everybody Body and particularly you for inviting me to be here and also acknowledge the welcome to country. Mm. And um, it's very interesting because uh, people uh, often uh, have assumed that Bach paintings were something that somehow done for Europeans. And uh, when you read many works about Aboriginal art, uh, it's as though uh, a European arrived, uh, a missionary or something like that, and said, oh, well, let's think of something to sell. Oh, how about you doing some paintings on bark? Now, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, bark has been a medium used by Indigenous Australians, obviously, for many thousands of years. Uh, we know the use of bark in Victoria from very early on, because the earliest bark uh, works, engravings, uh, in fact, uh, do come from uh, uh, this uh, part of uh, Australia. Um, Bark paintings were used in many different contexts uh, in uh, Arnhem Land, uh, and bark was used in many different kinds of ways. So uh, the paintings on the inside of wet season huts were something that was done for generation after generation after generation. Uh, so that's one of the contexts in which bark paintings are quite familiar. And the paintings from Western Arnhem Land that have become really quite well renowned, the X-ray arts from Western Arnhem Land, was the bark of the rock walls and of the bark huts. So the first sets of bark paintings that were collected uh, by uh, the uh, Melbourne uh, Museum uh, were Baldwin Spencer buying the bark huts. Uh, that people were living in, in Gunbalanya, and then subsequently getting people to paint on sheets of bark so they didn't have to keep on dismantling their huts. Um, in eastern Arnhem Land, you don't get X-ray art, and the art that uh, we know that was on bark huts from uh, photographs that people had taken were uh, paintings of, of fish, of uh, macassan uh, uh, prows, of animals, and things like that. Bark was also used uh, to make uh, material culture objects that were painted just as bark paintings are today. So people made bone containers, uh, and Piet Yong still will make those bone containers, uh, cylinders of bark that are sewn together at one end and then painted with paintings just like the ones that we see here. Uh, people also uh, use uh, bark paintings sometimes to demonstrate and show ancestral designs in ceremonial contexts. Today, people may, in the context of uh, uh, people's uh, burial ceremonies, uh, put a bark painting uh, close to the shade where uh, a body is uh, being held. And people, and Donald Thompson's notes, uh, says that uh, old men sometimes did paintings on bark to show each other the design. So bark painting was a medium that was used all the time, uh, which is how, in a sense, these magnificent paintings uh, done when Donald Thompson was uh, there in uh, northeast Arnhem Land, uh, more or less as one of the first Europeans to engage in positive relations uh, with uh, Yolngu uh, people. Uh, Donald Thompson was uh, sent in uh, 19. Uh, 35, uh, <coughs> instead of a government punitive expedition, Donald Thompson and a missionary were sent to 
uh, Eastern Arnhem Land to uh, find out what was the concerns of uh, Yolngu people uh, and what had caused certain uh, conflict with uh, uh, Japanese uh, fisher persons and perlers and things like that. And so Donald Thompson established this really close relationship uh, with Yolngu people from then. So the bark paintings that Donald Thompson collected were an integral part of both the research that he did, but of Yolngu people communicating the richness of their culture to someone from outside and partly to show their rights and uh, their belief that they had enormous things of value uh, in their world that in many ways they were uh, sharing with others. So this kind of paintings that you see on the uh, walls here, Donald Thompson really was the beginning of a history that goes right up to the present, where today we have many renowned Yolngu artists, of whom Wanyapi is one, who are painting in continuity um, with the past. So I think that's enough from me at this moment. <laughs> I would like yeah. to just go back to a point yeah. you made yeah. about the, the context in Arnhem Land yeah. at the time and um, I might ask Lindy if you mm -hmm. could really describe um, what was happening in Arnhem Land in the 1930s and the fact that there were very few people visiting but the ones who were visiting were of a particular kind and, and how Professor Thompson was different. Well, certainly even decades before the 1930s, there were a number of massacres in the sort of hinterland behind Blue Mud Bay. There was the East, in East Africa Coal Storage, storage Company, company um, who were based at Roper River, who, worked, who, who employed bounty riders to ride up through that country to clear the country for, um, for cattle. Um, so there was already this long history, decades long, of of, of um, violence wrought against Aboriginal people in that region. And then, of course, on the coastline you had tree pangers coming. Um, some were, of course, respectful of the rights of and, and, and acknowledged people's ownership of, of country and, and negotiated their, their, um, the ability to, be, to set up camp there and, and, and um, collect tree pang and the, you know, the Macassans for well, it's debatable how many years, but certainly a couple of hundred years had been coming and collecting tree pang and then taking it away and having a very sort of peaceful um, relationship with, with Aboriginal people. But around the 1920s, 1930s, um, a number of Japanese pearlers had moved in. The Commonwealth Government, when the Commonwealth Government took over the administration of the Northern Territory in the early 1900s, they actually stopped Macassans coming. So this new trade got taken over by, by other people and Japanese were a, a, a major part of that as well as other people, same as in Torres Strait as well. So there was this whole industry happening along the, the north coast. There was an incident um, at um, Caledon Bay, I think it was, with some Japanese fishermen who um, had been very disrespectful in relation to women in that country and um, were consequently speared by a number of um, uh, Yolngu in that area. Then consequent to that, a police party went in um, to investigate. And um, people may be familiar with the film Duckier versus the King. But if you don't, have, have a look at it. It, it covers that whole sort of um, time period really well. But again, there was an incident on um, Wooda Island where um, Constable McColl was subsequently speared, having um, also not been very respectful of the country and people's rights and, and women. So there was a, uh, a peace expedition that went, as, as Howard indicated, in 1932. Um, Reverend Watson went with this um, peace expedition to again investigate and find the culprits and they consequently took four men, well more men, but four men were taken to Darwin, arrested, put in jail, tried, convicted, one sentenced to, to death, but it made headlines around the world. And people like Henry Reynolds describe this period as a real watershed in terms of Indigenous and non-Indigenous relations in Australia because it really put, I mean it has all the, the sort of um, 
um, you know, deaths in custody, it has, you know, everything that we're still talking about today, you know, how evidence is taken in court, how translations taken, how people are, you know, how Yolma were actually represented in court. It smacked of all those sort of um, compromises in terms of Yolngu rights. So it really, the, the Australia, as a consequence of this whole incident, really grew up very quickly and, um, you know, we still suffer the same sort of debates, unfortunately, many, many years later. But Donald Thompson offered his services to go to Arnhem Land to investigate and, and seek um, a deal for peace so that it, he, he went there with a commission in 1935. It took a number of years for him to get there. But his um, main task was to broker a peace deal, which he did with a man called Wongul, a Japu man, leader of um, Japu people at um, Caledon Bay and Trial Bay. And Wongul gave his word that he would keep the peace and handed Donald Thompson a message stick, which is now in the Bukwilange um, Art Centre in a small case. So this is very small... Um, message stick, which is really a big story in Australia's history, um, that, but a very unassuming small little letter stick, as, often, as people often call them, is in that case. So if you go to your Yakala, <laughs> please go and have a look at that, because it's a very, very important object. His task was also to investigate the customs and language and, um, and people's lives, but interestingly, he was obviously a different sort of ballander who'd gone to, to Arnhem Land, and, and Wongul obviously believed this man would keep his word and so he then invited Donald Thompson into uh, Yolngu understandings of the world by doing a bark painting. So within the first sort of four or five days of arriving at the old man's camp, what Wongu did was painted a bark painting to, to instruct Donald Thompson. It's like Yolngu Understandings 101, you know, he <laughs> sat down and he painted those, all those designs, some abstract ones, um, different totems, some Yiritsha, some Dua from the, both moieties, to explain their world to Donald Thompson. Mm -hmm. So it was a really interesting sort of engagement. That's like how we're just saying there that mm -hmm. paintings were, were done to instruct people. That's exactly what um, Wongwu did with Donald Thompson. Mm -hmm. um, he did the same thing. And um, <sighs> Thompson was also very conscious of how he was coming across to Yongwu people as well. And um, I found it interesting that he chose to, you know, moor his boat a lot further south than where he needed to be and then undertake that journey across land because he wanted to mm. meet people on their country as a, as a man on foot rather than a man with, mm. you know, kind of the boat and the supplies and the horses and things. Mm. So mm. I think, you know, it says a lot about his consciousness and his interest to really, um, yeah, f f uh, be person to person with Yongu, which I think mm. is, yeah, a defining characteristic. Because yeah. yeah. what he did do, as Joanna said, he he um, sailed his boat to Roper River and he walked overland inland and he didn't mm. take a gun, he didn't go on horseback. He made all these deliberate strategies to not be mistaken for a police party or any of these bounty riders coming mm. into that area. Mm. And I wanted to ask you too, Lindy, before I um, ask you a question, <laughs> Wanubi, uh, do you think that the, this sort of the human dimension between the, of the relationships between Thompson and Wong Yu resulted in, you know, some of the the scale of the work and obviously the, in, the intensity of those designs. You know, if he was a different kind of person, for instance. It, it's interesting in Donald Thompson's notes, of course he does talk about painting traditions, or whatever, but he really doesn't talk about the context that these were created in. So yeah, it's really it's hard, to hard to say. I mean, we all have very strong opinions which may come out, you know, during this discussion, mm -hmm. but um, it was... It, and, and he took very few photos of bark paintings being produced. He took um, one of the okay. Wongu, or the, mm. the beautiful mm. bark painting on the back of this wall here, um, which you can't see, but have a look afterwards, was done by Wongu with three of his sons, and they each did a, a segment of the story. It looks like one painting. It's a beautiful collaboration um, and a very important story for Japul. But So he took a photo of them painting that one, the one by Yilkuri, which I think is in this maybe in the other room. Yeah. He painted Yilkri doing that, or maybe that wasn't selected in the no, end. No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And that's it. And then there's one photograph that I've seen when it's blown up. It almost looks like there's some guys preparing some bark in 1942 at Gathalala at that reconnaissance unit camp. But they could actually be cutting beef or whatever up on, on some bark as well. So it's interesting that, that 
to think about how these might have been created for him mm. when he doesn't write anything and he didn't document it. So uh, there's yeah. lots of speculation we can have around that. Yeah. But, I mean, these uh, barks are the sort of same size that you would expect bark that was being put on the roof of a bark hut or something mm. like that. So these big kind of sheets are what people would have had as uh, you know, roofing of right. bark huts and things like that. So there would have been Used what, a bark of that kind of scale. Yep. And I think it's quite likely uh, that the barks that people would have used to show each other designs, uh, rather like those body painting designs. So a lot of these have the structure of uh, body paintings, mm. uh, and they're slightly sort of, if you like, larger in scale, yeah. but they would be very much uh, the sorts of designs that people would be able to do to show each other what a clan design mm. of a particular mm. place was. So, um, yeah. Well, I might, um, on, on that mm. note, ask Wanubi to just talk about how these do very literally yeah. um, show the, the, the body uh, components. Wanubi, if you could just describe a little bit about how these would figure on the on a man or a boy's torso mm. there you go. Um, <laughs> sorry. i just want to i uh, think um or acknowledge to the to mm. of, uh, of this country and thank you to the museum that will bring us down here uh, a bit of a surprise to see how and, <laughs> and lindsay and, and the collection from the Donald Thompson that was before my time during 35, 1935. Mm -hmm. um, I was born in 1967, so way, <laughs> way back. Way before. Um, <laughs> uh, I think Howard and Lindsay already explained the, the collection of uh, Donald Thompson and, and the living and and why he collected the bark. I think it's a message of education, yeah. a message of um, we all have been here before European landed into Australia. So that's a message of, of this bark. That uh, with this Marae Minchi, Minchi is a pattern that holds inside our soul that links to the, to the land. And they identify every clan, tribes, that belongs to the, their country. Without this Minchi, you know, we nobody, we'd be changing color, we'd be talking English. <laughs> but lucky we have all this human law uh, that is still existing strongly inside us. And it can be educated by showing you the patterns of the design of the tribe. And they're not uh, translated in the book as you usually put your thing, put it in writing, but ours not. So have to keep it here. Um, I'm no. <laughs> well, overwhelmed by this uh, collection from Donald Thompson that. Um, it talks about uh, respect and a manner to tribe, a tribe to tribe respecting each other. Have to come in by a good manner and ask, ask whatever they want to take from the land. They ask permission. So that's that's what this one links. Even it talks about the merit ties. Uh, it's, we call it Yiricha Ntua, like yin and yang. Yiricha and Tua, they, they have to marry opposite, not, not door to door. We have the same blood there, have to be opposite from the mother side family. Eh? Yeah. Um, during the collection from Donald Thompson uh, and agreement with the Wongo for peace because um, there was a lot of shooting happening way back in Gangan area and the policeman was killed by my grandfather. He happened to be my mother's uncle, Mari Araku. 
So um, that's for even the even the fisherman was inspired, gotten by it because of they were sneaking on for your woman. I mean, so that's a penalty there for them for not coming in by in a good manner of negotiation. Yeah. So we all know, got uh, hard there to make good trade dealing what, what you want and what we want from you to have that good mainstream communication. I mean, peace, mm. justice of peace and harmony. So we got that uh, law in this Minchi that you're seeing now. Um, the way I understood or became an artist <laughs> when um, John Jonah explained, I was watching my father painting, young age and never know what he was doing. But that was a message for me to realize and understand that is your own law that sits here inside our soul. And we have to educate our young ones and educate our friends in Australia. So that's what he was trying to do. And then I heard that he was became a plaintiff of Leonard case. That's more higher in a political way. So uh, that made me my my mind opened up. So then I began to understand, do some painting work, track him down why he was sort of pulling my hands in what area pathway. So it's it's a way of bringing into a good leadership, respecting female and male and young children. Yeah. Do not do this, do not do this, don't do wrong things. That type of uh, law that sits under this meji here. Mm. And we do that every um, dry season, not at time. When As you can see a photo here, it's a very <laughs> special photograph. Yeah. It's a similarity to those paintings, but put it onto, <coughs> onto our body here, like that. It shows um, respect to your own law and your own, um, to, the, to the governance, to, uh, to good governance, mm -hmm. peace and harmony. In, in, in that area. And we have, we have to do that in respect of to the clan, what clan we're entering into and to the law. It's like going into a parliament, eh? to a federal government or Northern Territory government, whatever government we have. I see similarity, but in your own way of going into to uh, understand the uh, the, um, how you want to bring people into your unity, mm. one mind, one, one heart, yeah? and how you can bring Belanda, you guys Belanda, into, into our understanding, into this, that Australia has already got their area boundary with, with their patterns. We need to bring you in to understand where we're coming from. So somewhere in there, in the river, there should be a river there, main river, that we should be flowing in the same pathway, what our, our um, goals are. Whether we are cultural people, whether we are a technical people, or you know, those uh, positions that we're aiming for, we're sending children to understand and be a, a good citizens. We have a similarity in that area on this Yolongo base of law. Um, so, Wanubi, can I I'm ask you something? Sorry to, sorry um, to interrupt. Um, yeah. <laughs> you keep going, it's okay. It's that, that um, this one's painting that is put here is for initiation ceremony, young ones to become male, so they can have the, they can build up pain from the, the blood coming in, from childhood to man, manhood, and that's 
takes him into this system or catching fish or making umrah or making basket or helping mother and father going into that uh, system of adultery and then we put the painting of okay put this one your design you give initiation ceremony and you learn the stories in a song line in the paintings attaching to the knowledge of the country and then from there it's up to you whether you go your own system or whether you go Ngapake system yeah? whether you go the right track or off the track so it's up to us too whether we think which way is best I think I think this way is much better for me and for my family to um, stay in a clear clear water not a muddy water clear where we can see where wrong and right hmm? and then another one is about when there's a big operations we, we put painting on just to clear clear his um, his eating eating thing and and the mother and the brother had to come in and, and share things. So when the painting's put in, it make it clear too for them to be free to use or talk to him like that. Another one ma is another ceremony like a parliament, a parliament, your parliament is held and maybe week months the continuing of the corbury. And when it's finalized ma, day, final day ma, we have the cleansing ceremony. And then, then the patterns put on our body. I mean, we're respecting and we've got to stick to that the good governance and law of your law to have a good manner, respecting each other like that. That's why that one's put in. Similar to what you're seeing here. Yeah. Um, uh, that's my final talk, ma. Okay. Yeah. Thank <laughs> just, you. Just on that about the Nara ceremony, these ones over here, we do know when Donald Thompson collected some barks, <coughs> it was after Nara ceremony and he photographed the men yeah. with those body paintings yeah. and then we know within a short while some paintings were produced like that, mm. like these two particular ones over here by Makani mm. are after a big Nara at Milangimbi. So... Mm exactly what, what you're saying. So they've documented themselves. Mm. You all know have documented yeah. it in a, in a sort of, you know, yeah. permanent form for... for, mm. the, yeah. for yeah, if you see that well. um, with the, on top of that, no, it, that's all like a parliament, parliament yeah. um, mm. painting. Yeah? Mm. That not to be copyright, or we'll put it onto bark or we'll put it onto um, sheet or whatever. Mm. That, that remains as it is, yeah. mm. and it's, it's sensi sensitive too. It's a matter of um, if you do it wrong, you're six inches down under <laughs> grave. <laughs> so that's yeah. what we've been doing in the past. Yeah. 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 You have to be correct and accurate yeah. and not stealing someone else's ID, identification. So that identifies every tribe yeah. that belongs to that yeah. clan uh, country. You, um, when you be yesterday, when you saw these works for the first time, you said uh, we should write down the, the, the country on the label that each of these paintings refers to. Mm. Um, you were really particular about that and we went and looked at Google Earth and tried to zoom in and, and <laughs> so that I could make a note of all of these places yeah. because, you know, obviously that's a really key point is that mm. they they refer to country and then the ancestors that made that land and then all of the people and those relationships. Um, but you also said something really fascinating yesterday in talking about your own work and, yeah, and talking about the way that you paint designs today. You said that your innovations and your slight changes mm. were like twisting the arm of your father. <laughs> and um, I'd like to, to know more about that and, right. and what you mean. Mm. Um, on that Minji uh, Wako, um, really doing more painting, my, my tribe plan design is more accurate and 
not to be changed. The way they see uh, the, the sea and the land is different, differently from the way I see it. I see a country that is movable. The wind's moving and the water's moving and the, and, and the sand is moved by wind. So they, they, they're moving. So that's how I see and put it into my, my painting where my fathers, they put it a little bit, um, how can I put it? Do you know, more fixed or rigid? Uh, yeah. <laughs> they see it as they are and put it in, in a different um, line, like has crotch, head crotchings, eh? mm -hmm. squares. But that's how they see country and, and sea. Well, my, my vision is different, mm. but still links to the story to, to the to, to their, um, information that is given to us. Yeah. Yeah, um, and then it becomes uh, a twist in the hand, really, like that. Mm. Even though I'm twisting my father's hand like that, just a little bit, <laughs> not too much, but <laughs> just for, um, well, they've recognized, their name's been recognized and became an artist. So somewhere in the line I had to sort of jump ahead, hop up, up ahead into my father's toe and then maybe twist his hand, hand and make, make my name a little bit uh, recognized, reconciliation. Mm. No? Well, uh, mark up. And then another one ma is Boyak. Yeah. Boyak is invisible. If you see a painting like here, can you see a snake? It's a lightning snake, Mundokul. It's a simi similarity to the last one here. That's lightning snake. That's this one here. Boyak is invisible. From, from your distance, it's invisible. You can't see a mm. snake there. Because eh? it's all, all sort of like, like in the same parallel eh? line. Well, the snake's sort of sitting under the water or under the mangrove. The mangrove covers it. And, and the white lining, to finish it off, it's boyakna. The snake sitting underneath, under the water or under the mangrove. Well, I've done the same thing. A moonfish or, or rock or other sea creatures that is on, on, on surface, on top, the way our, our people has been drawing. So I changed that into sitting under, under the water. So the water is covering the fish underneath like that, instead of on, on surface like that. So it's another thing again, twist the pain up and put And it's called boyak. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. okay, sorry. Mm, thanks, Monibi. So I, I might um, let uh, my ngapepi here uh, have a rest <laughs> and uh, pick up on some of those points that uh, he was making uh, in relation uh, to the fact that these paintings are all connected to land. They all have patterns, and you'll see when you're looking at these different paintings, there are different sort of geometric patterns behind it. So you can see the patterns there of those particular triangles, and people looking at those paintings there in their detail will see that they uh, belong to a clan called the Miljingi uh, clan, which is a clan of people who uh, live uh, over towards a place called Milingimbi. Anybody looking at this particular design here, any Yolnu person, will actually recognize this as a pattern that uh, is connected to this ancestral snake at a place called Baralcha. So there's a particular place, and that particular place is connected to two clans that come together, be belonging to one of the moieties, the Madapa clan, that's uh, Wanyapi's mother's clan, mm. and the Dalwangu uh, clan. And uh, you can see two different patterns here. Uh, on the, this area here, which would be painted on the top of the legs, you can see at the bottom there, uh, and that uh, particular pattern there uh, belongs um, to uh, the uh, clans 
inland, I think it's Mardapa uh, uh, Freshwater and Dalwa yeah, clan, yeah. Uh, that flows in to this place here. Yeah. So in the scale of this painting here, this place is just Baralcha. This is where that great snake, Mundakul, stood up, heralding in the wet season. Yeah. This is a place where this ancestral snake made the fish trap yeah. that goes across the river mouth yeah. using ribs from that snake, but also the mangrove leaves for uh, helping to uh, make the dam of the fish trap that goes yeah. across the river. So this here is that fish trap at this very, very, very important place. Yeah. And this is those water, fresh waters, flowing into that place because it's in the wet season that that fish trap is made by Yolngu people mm. today. Yeah. And so these are signs of their ancestral footprint, Jalkiri, in the land, in the place. Yeah. And then uh, over here, uh, you can see very different pattern. And Yolngu people looking at this uh, pattern here will see it's a pattern associated with a clan called the Japu, yeah. Japu clan. And this pattern here means uh, clouds in the uh, rain coming over. Uh, the, you can hear these goannas. This is a place in Blue Mud Bay, at the south, uh, uh, north of Blue Mud Bay. And just by looking at that different pattern there, uh, you can see uh, uh, that uh, it belongs to a particular uh, place. And uh, every time when you go along looking at these paintings, you're looking at them in detail, you'll see differences and variations in the uh, patterns uh, of uh, the designs. And so all of these paintings are then uh, connected to land and place. And, and, and they're used in uh, uh, different ceremonial contexts for different kinds of reasons. So what Wanyapi was saying was he giving three examples of how these paintings, one is a, a dapi or circumcision ceremony, yeah. when it will be used uh, on uh, body painting on the chest of a young uh, boy who will be lying there for maybe four or five hours having that painting put on their chest. And it's uh, a, a, an incredibly important occasion uh, for, uh, in that uh, child's life. And then maybe if someone has like an injury or something like that, one of the paintings that you'll see uh, in uh, the next room, mm. there's a, a body painting by, uh, from the Ritangu clan, uh, and uh, it was a painting that Donald Thompson said was the same as was done on someone recovering from an illness. Mm. So when people are sick, maybe uh, their spirit lets a little bit weak, mm. but when they recover, then they will give that identity, that strength from that ancestor back. Right. And then another occasion is, is like this. And this really shows this painting, this continuity, because that um, design there on uh, the painting on my left is uh, a version of this painting here, done uh, some uh, 60, 70 uh, years later mm. on. Uh, you'll see slight variations in it because Yolngu paintings, every time someone does a painting, there can be slight differences, uh, yeah. but the, the idea yeah. uh, and the form is one that carries on. So, yeah. And oh. can I also just yes. ask you, Howard, to, um, you know, to talk about this idea that, that this information, these designs are, are sacred and they appear in different contexts, but their, their meaning doesn't change in itself. There's the, there's this, um, the, the meaning stays the same, but the knowledge of the person looking at <coughs> the design is, is what activates different aspects of, of the meaning. Because I think there's an, there's an understanding that particular designs can be too sacred to be seen, but in Yongu context, it seems to be that's not the case. Before you answer before. that. <laughs> yeah. Well, this one is painted by males only. Yeah. The the fathers, the senior elders were given to the daughters and wives to do painting. Yeah. Then yeah. that throughout the given to them to do a painting. Yes. I mean yeah. 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 So I mean look, this is a very important uh, story and in, in fact it's uh, one uh, that uh, Yolngu men often now emphasize. Uh, that uh, over time, uh, 
uh, women have become more involved in a way in, in the painting. Women were always involved in the ceremony, but these paintings here would have been done uh, by uh, men from mm -hmm. the community. Oh. And then in the 1950s, uh, some of the senior uh, men of the community, people like uh, Maolang and uh, Narichin mm -hmm. and uh, Mungarawi, mm -hmm. uh, started to encourage uh, their uh, uh, daughters, mm. uh, because you inherit uh, the paintings from your, your father and the law from your father, whether you're a man or a woman, mm. it's your father's law. Mm. And so they uh, then uh, began to be involved in painting, helping mm. uh, sometimes with the cross-hatching, but today there are uh, women uh, 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 painters who will be painting uh, paintings uh, uh, as, as well. Mm. So uh, very much uh, the paintings are ones that are uh, associated with uh, the clan mm. and all the time Yolngu society changes a little bit mm. but carries on its strength. So it's very uh, dynamic. Mm. Um, the question that you asked uh, about the, the meanings of paintings, look, each one of these paintings, um, a Yolngu person connected to this country could uh, to say much about. And how it's often said is through dances and songs. So I think it might be, uh, in Wanyabi's case, he was talking about uh, paintings that he does associated with the Jankar sisters mm. now uh, at, at Yellenborough. And uh, these are very f famous paintings. Mm. Uh, and the pattern uh, in the background is uh, a series of uh, um, parallel lines that you know, cross cut. <laughs> and um, those uh, Janka sisters, mm. there are song cycles um, connected with them, song lines. And there'll be many, many songs, and those songs will be danced and performed. And the songs may be about uh, the uh, Goanna and uh, moving in the sand, mm. maybe about the wind moving in the sand, maybe about digging water holes in the sand. All of those meanings are in the painting. Mm. So it's not just one meaning, and they'll be danced in a ceremony, no. and in different ceremony, they different emphasis. Mm. Um, so it's, 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 it's just the beginning, really, of mm. the story story is the painting, and it mm. then gets connected to the dances, to mm. the songs, the manikai, yo. Jankawong, <laughs> <laughs> Jankawong sisters. Two sisters and a brother uh, coming in from the western side, north, northeast, west, landed at Port Prachu, Elambra. Very significant role, a law. Uh, uh, respect we have respect to women because they they're the main main um, creator they even carried the birth of the children and they've collected the food so they women is a very important role in in our area but the men also used plastic to sing the song song line so together the two sisters and a brother were sort of sharing the knowledge of the story and the song line. Yeah. Um, because the movement from the pedal, they've been seeing the great chisholm go and uh, uh, fish, have a movement of the flying box, the movement of the uh, red lorchets for the birds, the movement of the water, hmm? every time they dig in, with a, with a digging stick, they used it as a paddle. They plunge it to the ground, the fresh water comes out. Even the fresh water is still running out of salt water. So we have a uh, very significant area that we have to, if we stir in the sea, we, get, we know where the fresh water is coming out. So we have to jump in and drink water inside. Fresh water. Mm -hmm. So that's my, 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 my secrets of mm -hmm. where the movements of the ancestors been going. Mm. They also met um, uh, Macassans. Mm. Macassans told them off, this is not your area, you should go 
and do your um, tripping, fishing somewhere else. You're, you're standing in my property. Here. So they, they moved him out. So, so it looked like they've met. Make mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. they, they also seen a, another boat group called, we call it Balanda, but it's a Hollander. <laughs> Hollander. Yeah. Eh? They're from yeah. Holland. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And the boat was called Arnhem Land. Arnhem. So they, that's why they named the Arnhem region yeah. by Hollanders. Yeah. And those Hollanders were named by our mob, Balanda. So with B A L A N D A, but it's H O L A N D A. Mm. Yeah. So the spirit of history there of mm. the boat crews and the mm. Macassans mm. met by our ancestors. Mm. There's some beautiful Macassan boats uh, in the next gallery, which were painted by Wong Wu and uh, mm. one of his sons, and also some Groot Island artists. Yeah. Where we can see that the shape of that sail. Mm. You, you know, Good Island paintings, they're, they're the boat cruise of the year, mm. of the Hollanders map. Mm. Uh, and the, um, uh, the Mamarika clan yeah. has the, the, the east wind, northeast yeah. wind. Mamarika clan from Good Island. Yeah. They got the same, same surname like my Marika. Yeah. It's a northeast, northeast wind, wind name after that. Mm. <laughs> and um, I mean, when uh, Wanyabi was talking about how a particular pattern in the Ririchingu paintings can have all of these different kinds of meanings, uh, as an example, we can look at those uh, paintings uh, that we can see over there, the Yiricha paintings, uh, because uh, they, uh, uh, you know, we can see them as geometric designs. There are a whole series of triangles in different colors. Well, what are the significance of those different colors? Uh, well, there are multiple significances, but one thing to do with those particular paintings is they're connected to uh, the wet season and the Yiricha moiety and the coming of the wet season. And when you're looking at the horizon, uh, you can see the clouds in the distant horizon and the effect of sunrise, sunset on the clouds and the buildup of the clouds. And some of those clouds are black and uh, mm. thick with rain. Yeah. Some are catching brilliantly the rays of the sun yeah. uh, in the redness. Some are pouring with rain. Mm. So one of the ways of interpreting those particular paintings mm. there is going to be in relation to the wet season. Yeah. At, so it's a particular time of year and it's to do with the coming of the Macassans. In other paintings, that same kind of design, because when the Macassans came, um, the, uh, 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 the, the, sorry, the one of the things is that it's the reflections of the clouds in the water as well. Mm -hmm. So Jung are always looking at water and the patterns in the water and the relationships and the flows of water. And so you can actually see uh, the patterns that are in the water that are caused by those particular kind of reflections. Mm. But in another context, uh, that particular design associated with their, the um, uh, Miljingi, but also it's a design associated with a clan called the Waramiri clan. Mm. And in the case of the Waramiri clan, that's connected with a whale. Mm. And a whale comes at that particular time of the year. And the Macassans used to harpoon whales. They would cut whales up. So you could actually interpret that pattern there also to do with whales being cut up into segments mm -hmm. uh, with the blood coming from the whale, with different patterns to do with the whale and so on and so forth. So each of these patterns that you mm -hmm. can see has many, many different kinds of meanings. No. And those patterns are connected to the different clans and the songs. No. And if you listen to the songs, mm. then you'll hear all of those kinds of meanings. No. And in fact, the if you look at the photos outside that Joanna selected for the exhibition, there's some Warramary men there painted mm. with that whale oh. triangular pattern. So you'll be able to compare yeah. that with yeah. those. Mm. Yeah. So mm. it's still the triangle, but very much you'll see what, how it's saying. And does that relate to the, fl the, v the flat, the horizontal bark? The as flat well, horizontal one as well. That's quite, got some it, it's the only one in Thompson's collection that has actually an historical image. That's the one with the steamer. So it's got the yeah. steamer up in the, in the yeah. top right hand corner, but that's the whale in the, in, in the middle, that middle of that section. One. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Which is beautifully depicted 
representing the tail, but also the, the open mouth. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, the thing is that these paintings are deeply connected with knowledge and with history. Mm. Yeah. And that yes. example of the whale and the steamer and the Waramiri, yeah. we can then connect this in a surprising way to this painting here by a man called Jim Baryun. Now, Jim Baryun was a Munyoku, Munyoku. person. Yeah. His country, one of his countries, is a place called Yarinya. This is not a painting of Yarinya, mm. but he, it was his country as well. Yeah. And at Yarinya, it's connected to the whale yeah. and uh, uh, the anchors of the whale. It's also connected to the steamship yeah. and the smell uh, caused by the smoke from steamships. So there are Yolnu songs about steamships mm. that connect to whales because of the smell does this cross connection. And wherever you get uh, the uh, whale, then you get a connection also to the steamship and the anchor and things like that. So uh, different clan, different place, but a connected story. So some of these stories um, connect to different clans, always of the same moiety. Mm. Yeah. So the connection, so the Jankar sisters um, that uh, Wanyapi was talking about, there may be a lot of dual moiety clans where they travel, to, they'll have different pattern in each mm. case, uh, but uh, those song lines connect uh, them um, across. Mm. And that painting here is an example of that too, Howard. Yeah. This one here was done at Mel and Gimby, and it's Walamangu and Wongori. No. Yeah. Um, and they're quite distant apart. One's Melangimbi, which is sort of central Arnhem land. Wangari country is more over near, near Wanyapi's country. But they have this strong connection through ancestral, shared ancestor, song lines, Manjakai, Manjakai mm. group. But historically, the Wangari moved to Melangimbi to affiliate themselves more strongly with, mm. with their clans because of various reasons, but also because the mission was there. So people today see that as a really important historical document. It's like the Bark Petition. It's like this union and mm. at, at, at Melangimbi no. that still plays out in politics and, no. and life at Melangimbi mm. between different clans as well. But that design in the middle you see on paintings from more near Yirrkala Way, no. Dallanboy, um, but it's this affiliation, that, that, that connection across the sea as well. Mm. Through songs, yeah. ceremony, yeah. and and as Howard was saying, you see the different patterns. So the lower pattern is the Wangari, and the the top pattern is the waters um, around Melangimbi. That's Wallamangu yeah. clan. Yeah. Mm. Maybe I could ask you, Lindy, to talk a little bit about the scale. Um, it, it's just really obvious when you look at the Leonard Adam ones, which are a little bit later, 1950s, and you know, um, Yolanda worked very closely with the Methodist missionaries. I mean, that's Church Missionary Society, but certainly at Yirrkala and Menangimbi and Goulburn Island, people were producing smaller barks as time went on because they're more portable. Mm. You know, you have visitors. I mean, there was the mine established at... at um, at Groot Island yeah. very yeah. early on. So people were responding to outsiders being there as well, you know, in the decades following this. So by the 1950s, you know, some people describe them as suitcase size, but, you know, I mean, it's a very much a sort of smaller, um, more portable form. Mm. Um, I mean, the Groot Island works are quite, they are quite different to what we've been discussing with the, mm. these Yongu body painting mm. barks. Um, they're, they depict much more sort of contemporary events and totemic animals, not so much, you know, something that's religious or spiritual. Um, but that's an indication as well that there, has, there had been this intercultural um, liaison that had been happening for, for longer on Grid Island. So the Grid Islanders were able to decide, you know, what to paint and, and reveal as... Um, as an as a object of exchange, because there was the, the Qantas refuelling base, which I think was established in the mid-30s. So through that process, people had been coming and going. And um, yeah, but the, the scale of these is quite remarkable, even, even today in terms of contemporary practice. Working with a, preparing a bark like this, Wanubi would be quite a lot of work. Finding, you know, a good sized tree and <laughs> <laughs> climbing up. And perhaps you could um, tell us a little bit about how the barks are prepared. 
again. <laughs> uh, ma. Firstly, we've got to wait till the dry season's finish. And now it's nearly wet season now, it's starting to rain. Now, the following month or so is the time to collect bark because the moisture here and the bark will be got kind of water in it, it's easy to peel because every time when we cut cut the bottom trunk of the tree, cut it around and cut on the top of the area and then peel it off like that. And then it looks like um give me that paper paper there. Oh this it looks like like that, it curls up the bark and then when we put it onto fire it opens up like that. The bark dries up because the heat get the moisture off and it dries up. And then we put it onto our ground somewhere dry for two weeks, put heavy log on top of that to flatten it, to flatten, flatten the bark like that. So we have to wait nearly two weeks to wait to dry it up. Eh? And then after that, it's time to scrape it, scrape the, um, the outside bark and make that, that inside bark, the white part, mm. scrape it too, so you can, you have the white, white inner inside is sort of coming out. And after that, use um, a smooth and rough sandpaper to, mm. to clear that rough, rough etchings, make it smooth. And maybe after a couple of days, then put the red ochres like that, red ochre. Now, the reason for putting the alka is because uh, it's, it's linked to, to this minji tulang here that we put on, on our body. So we, before we put that, we put our red ochre on top of us first. That's <coughs> what, what that man mean. It's another way of meaning um, we got birth from mother. Eh? And so we got a bit of blood on our body. Another ah. yeah. word. Yeah. Or, or snake, swall swollen human, and then when he spit out, mm. he's still got that blood on his body. Mm. That's what that, this means. Eh? You know, before, before the actual design comes onto our body. Mm. Yeah? Mm. Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> And then after that, we use a, a same brush, like this one, bark, yeah. but put it into a brush and put it into similar size, like that, to, to make that... Um, An outline of the pattern. Oh, yeah. like that. Yeah. But it's a brush. We use it as a brush. Eh? Yeah. One, this one. There's another one, balur. Yeah. There's another one sitting in the bush, that wood glue. Yeah, 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 yeah. We use that as a glue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's an orchid. Mm. Mix it up with the water yeah. and then it looks like a glue and it's, it sticks, the color sticks. Eh? Before we paint it, we collect the colors first. Red, red, Morungun. Morungun is red. Uh, Puttalak is yellow. Puttalak. Uh, Kurungan is black. Either it's one of those manganese, manganese okay. rocks, yeah. or the navy, that one, Kurungan. And then another one is Watar. Watar is white, whether it's a clay. Yeah. Clay from the cliff, yeah. cliff from the face of the, uh, the broken navy on the sea. Yeah. Eh? The white clay, you see the white clay? Either there, get it up from there, collect it, or collect it from the uh, river side. There's a river, there's a clay inside. So, that's the color of the actual 
for all irritated to uh, to use it. Eh? As you can see, there's no green, there's no pink, there's no blue. There's a little bit of pink. This yeah, one, this one. <laughs> that's that's, that's, another, that's, that's another that's tribe the from Galawinku. Yeah, yeah, that's another tribe. But yeah. the original from Arnhem Land yeah. is original. Yeah. That color there, yeah. yellow yeah. and red and black and white. That's the original color for yeah. for ours. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Now, going back to the brush, mm. collecting the brush, and then we draw the actual lining there, and draw the 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 um, cross hatching. You know, and yeah. and the birds and all yeah. that fish right. drawings. Uh. After that, then we use a, a fine hair like that one. <laughs> you see the fine Lindy's hair, <laughs> like this one? Yeah. Yeah, the f that yeah. fine hair, the straight one. That's for, for that white fine hair there, you see that? Yeah. That's, that's fine hair, like that, see? You have to be upwards, not, not downwards, up, mm. upwards mm. like that. Mm. So it uh, goes up like that, see? Mm. And you see the color there? White, and then another one here, black, and then another one red, and then one white, black, and white, and yellow, like that, see? Mm. So that's the color of the, it talks about um, the color in the land, and color in the sea, mm. even though it's green and blue, and no, but the mm. green and blue is not here. Have to put it into black or, or yellow, mm. eh? like that. And then finalizing that is by wh white, mm. white finish it off mm. with the fine hair. Yeah. You ever painted with anything other than ochre? Sorry. You ever painted with other kinds of paints, like a, like acrylic paints ever? If the uh, ochres are a bit hard to find, then we have to use. <laughs> no, <but you> paint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, ochre is the. But this one's uh, natural color. Yeah. Where Napaki paint sometimes, when when the red is covering, and later on maybe two three years time, it will be reddish color. Mm. With acrylic or Napaki paint, but the natural paint which doesn't turn up like that. it's just sit there, na normal, yeah. natural. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this this, yeah. this guy is um, this guy is um, I gotta stand up because yeah. I gotta I gotta pay respect to them. These these people are um, real warriors. They're warriors. They've been t into battles. They've been to you know whatever whoever stealing the property and 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 that pattern by another tribe, they, they, they have to um, drop him off for doing his, for mm. doing wrong thing. So th these people are very, um, what do you call it? Powerful lawmen, perhaps, do you think? <laughs> Something like that, yeah. <laughs> no? Put it that way, yes. <laughs> you see me now, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of not in that, in that, in that part of the world. I'm, yeah. I'm sort of in a, half European world and half no, so I'm, I'm living in another part of the world. These guys, they're not, they're straightforward mm. in their own way of thinking culture. And, um, you know, survival, it's made of survival too. Mm. And so they have to be real accurate with their paintings mm. to, to survive and live and to create their family. So they, they, these people are, you know, they the bush people, really. They, they've been contacted by people like Tom, Donald Thompson and others, um, McKesson's, uh, the mm -hmm. boat crew, you know. They've been seeing, you know, yeah. these another tribe people with yeah. another color coming in, mm. in, entering into their country, yeah. while, while these people are sort of in their own mm. world, yep. in, in their own background. <coughs> Identity, identification. Mm -hmm. So, I was surprised 
and I felt, um, gee, I'm looking into these people that I never know them, I've never seen them, these guys. And now I s I'm just seeing their patterns, and I can identify where they're coming from. Mm. Like this one is my mother clan group, Madarpa. Right? And that one, Japu, is my Mari clan group, Mari, my, my mom's mother's clan group, mother. And that one's my another wakko there. Mm. But that mm. one also linked with Madarpa from Baikurchi. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's two similarity, like a mother clan and a wakko. Two. There's Emu going into Urup, Urup Lagoon. There's my another wakko there, linked with Mangalili tribe. That one, sea country, links to the whale country, with Waramri, Munyoko. Yeah and Lama, Lama right. Miri, yeah. And this one's Munyoko again. <coughs> See? And I've been seeing their Facebook on their book when Donald Thompson was taking photos and, uh, gee, they're a bit wild. You know? <laughs> they, they, they're living in another, another part of a world of survival. Yeah. Of, you know, where now you're seeing me, I'm, I'm with you guys, see? <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> yeah, see, yeah. So, so, um, so the, my group there, they will call me a coconut, like <laughs> I'm half outside I'm black, inside I'm white, yeah, like that. <coughs> but anyway, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm a little bit, a um, bit uh, um, in a motion of thinking them. Gee, because I was seeing on a book, and now I'm seeing yeah. real ones here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the names. Um, but yeah. you, you can see how much knowledge is, is there with one who'd be seeing for the They're first time. They're probably here with me standing right now in the spirit. Mm -hmm. Who, who's yeah, this yeah. guy talking about our <laughs> thing? Yeah, That's yeah. what they're seeing, <laughs> talking to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 That's what they can see me. Because. Yeah. Yeah. We c I, can I can feel the spirit of theirs in present world, while these ones are here. Yep. Mm -hmm. They can tell me, hey, who's that somebody <laughs> talking about my property? <laughs> <laughs> they, yeah. they can do that. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. But I should have come in and pay my respect by making Bilma. Mm -hmm. Because through that Bilma, the ceremony, it it's opens up doorway to entering into this Minchi, Tulang yeah. Oku. That's, that's how I'm um, customary law of paying respect to these people mm. here. Yeah. <coughs> Yolngu people can have a design that can be done on a, a small object like a Bilma mm. or something like that. Mm. Uh, can be done <coughs> on a body painting, can be done as a ceremonial ground as a sand sculpture. Mm. So um, if you saw the photograph that was going around, this painting here was also a ground sculpture at that ceremony. So people can do these Oop. things at different scales in different media, but they're all then connected in no. to uh, that same no. place. Yeah. And uh, the design could be on a party, on a sacred basket yeah. that's connected to the place. So hmm. many, many different designs yeah. in different medium. Yeah. Yeah. So as um, Howard been saying, this one, for example, my mother clan group, this one, Madarpa. It's uh, the lightning snake here. We play the game of of um, like hide and seek, like not that already. Mm. The snake, his tongue sort of light lightning out to another tribe, clan groups. They're talking to each other. Uh, I want you to search around, make sure nobody's stealing my my property. Like that, this tribe saying to another tribe. Here, you got same same um, uh, marine, yeah. but make sure you stick to your own design. But we will come together 
in this ceremony. That's how the lightning snake talks. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? It's another way of saying enemies coming in from another, another part of the area, from angle, angle, enemy. This one say, throw his tongue out, message up to another, another lightning snake's people, and they make a circle of, mm. to cover that, or block that, or stop that enemy. So we're still playing that part of um, role. Eh? Very important. Bullo, another one. It opens up to another, another doorway. There's another doorway that you're learning, you're seeing the actual the parliament mm. shelter. And another doorway, this is Saint culture. Yep. There's another door there, headbands, armbands. Decorated by feathers. Yeah. Hmm? And another one there, it's a bodyguard with a spear and woomera. Get ready to spear you. <laughs> <laughs> Too deadly. Yeah. Yeah. Just that. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, my, it's a Kalka job. No? Kalka is uh, like yeah. um, assassinate, right? Eh? Assassinate or? Sorcerer. 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 Yeah. Well, yeah? It's like a ninja. They come in the night time and they kill you. Like that. Just to protect, protect this from stealing and handing over to another tribe. Mm. If they cut you off That's real quick. On the mm. hey, okay. yeah. That's what they've been doing in the past. That's why by honoring these people, they, they, they're like that in the past. One tribe stealing another tribe, finish straight through here. Six inches down, dead. Mm. It might be very good that Joanna's put those three on the back there. Those ones are <laughs> Galka by Galka. <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah. protecting it. Keeping, keeping yeah. an eye That's on it. That's a things. technique over there, the painting. They're the Galkas. Yeah. <laughs> but our Galka is, is like, um, you know, spear to spear like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. In a broad daylight. <laughs> or night time, they will come in night time. Mm. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting thing. You all know, have worked with anthropologists for a long time. They know what anthropologists uh, study. And I was once uh, uh, opening an exhibition uh, with uh, Jambo Marawili, who was really supposed to be opening it as well with me. And so he did an opening song. And then uh, people uh, then uh, asked him a, a question. And uh, he s you know, pushed me to answer it. And they said, oh, no, we want... Uh, uh, Jumbo had to answer this question mm -hmm. and he said to me that's your job he said <laughs> I did the paintings <laughs> so um, anyway uh, you all know uh, very much aware that different people have different kinds of talents and abilities mm. some great uh, you all know leaders are good songmen but they can't paint one of the really greatest you all know leaders uh, that I uh, knew was someone who said, I don't paint, I can't hold the brush. <laughs> uh, because the technique of this kind of painting is something that really requires a particular kind of control, discipline, learning, and so on. So not everybody's going to have that ability. But um, people, uh, if they show aptitude and are interested and uh, learn, sure. and then they will uh, get the trust of those who are teaching them and gradually they will get more and more responsibility. Mm. So they start off uh, by uh, becoming technically accomplished, no. able to do uh, the uh, technical uh, work, no. and then uh, they will be encouraged uh, to help with paintings, and then maybe one or two designs people will uh, show them, uh, and uh, people will then start to uh, take uh, more responsibility uh, and very often in a ceremonial context, uh, when you're having a body painting like that, there'll be two or three people working at it mm. um, together. So uh, it's not unusual to uh, see uh, somebody will be setting the design. People will look at it. They'll make sure that the underlying design is set properly in the no. right design. No. And then uh, uh, the technical accomplishment is something that is uh, then uh, uh, done to make the final appearance of the work, but you set the design uh, first of all. So it is, it's, it's, and, and p some people will be recognized uh, as their um, ability
to be ceremonial leaders. They'll have the memory to memorize all of the names that you have to sing out in a ceremonial mm. uh, context. Yeah. And as well as having, uh, so it, it's, it's lifelong learning really, isn't it? Mm. Mm. You can, you can uh, see whether I've said the right thing there. <laughs> I think you covered it most. <laughs> uh, I'll just a um, little bit um, explain to you about um, the Yoti Indi Mai Kottara, that one relation. Yoti Indi, especially this one, the mother, mother is Indi, mother clan is Indi. Yoto is the nephews and niece. Not, not counting the sons and daughters, the nephews, the, the, um, the brothers, yeah. sisters, sons, nephews and niece. They Yoto. And then our, our niece and daughters are they Kuttara. Kuttara. So there's Mari, Yoti, Indi, Mari, Kuttara. That relation. The other line have to be sticking to this information. I mean, the other people will be taught. Make sure long as it sits in order. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. In order and following the same design in the story. Not jumping from this design to another tribe, to another tribe. You're, you're breaching that rule, eh? another tribe. That Yutindi, Makbatala population, Yutindi, have to be more about 200 population of Yutindi. There will be a lot of Indies, yeah. maybe more from, from his brothers and from his brothers' family. And then down below that, the brother sister's family. And then below that, another family group. So you're seeing maybe 200 more, more than that population in this, tr in this yeah. connection. Yeah. Yeah. And those family have to be taught the same, same story, knowledge of that, whether they are painter, whether they are song lines, mm. whether they are dancing, or yeah. whether they are um, sand culture and everything, <coughs> different, different certificates of understanding, mm. learning, whether, whether they are making headbands, art mm. different, different uh, techniques in, in the same order of what's been placed here. Oh, cool. Yeah, like that. That's how yeah. we teach yeah. young ones, as long as, long as yeah. they're going the right pathway. Mm -hmm. If they're going another way, ma, right, then he's losing his life. And like that. <laughs> Did I cover that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you get rights mm. to different paintings according to your relations that you have. So you have well, the right to your own clans. Uh, paintings that oh. you'll learn from uh, the elders of that particular clan. But you also have connection and responsibility uh, to uh, what would be called um, the, the clan uh, of your, your mother, uh, the clan that you are a waku for. Oh. And in some ceremonies, you'll be helping them oh. and uh, helping to do the paintings oh. uh, for them. And you also get some rights to a clan called your mother's mother or your Mari clan. Oh. Uh, and in a way, uh, you need to know about your Māori clan's no. law, and they will be looking after you as well. No. So you're learning in an environment uh, no. in which uh, there are certain uh, uh, law uh, that you are then uh, closest to and will have greater aptitude for. Hmm. Some uh, 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 people, as they become uh, really, really senior people no. and people like a jirikai, a person of no. great knowledge, no. uh, will have uh, the authority to work across mm. quite a lot of clans that they're not necessarily connected to in that particular way. But guru to relationship is something that really mm. you can connect yourself to almost everybody no. in the mm. universe. You know. We count on, on people's behavior. Who, who, which people or family is behaving themselves, you know, like feeding mother and father, buy fish or whatever. Huh? That behavior and a good manner and a respect, they're, they're the people who have to go into that system to learn. Yeah. And if that person is um, careless and, you know, 
doing bad things, then yeah. he's not bringing, he, we're not yeah. bringing him in it, into that system. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let him stay, out, stay outside. And he will teach uh, not, not discipline from another tribe like that. Yeah. <laughs> You'll go uh, at one level know that these are things that Europeans value by what they look like. So uh, they are powerful works uh, that you can experience emotionally. And I think people, you all know people, uh, when uh, politicians come or when lawyers come, they will give them gifts because they know that people, just by looking at them, will find these are fine objects. So in that sense, it's respecting people's skills, abilities, that kind of thing. So then, but they are also very concerned uh, that uh, people should, as much as possible, if they wish to, learn a little bit more about them. So in the case of uh, Jambo Marawili, who I believe is having an exhibition, it's part of a group show. Of a group show after this year, one. Yeah. After this one. Uh, has uh, 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 had a, uh, an exhibition of his works at the Sydney Biennale maybe two, three Biennales ago. And in his artist statement, uh, he said, uh, I don't want people just to look at these and say they're just pretty pictures. They all have a meaning. I want them to understand something of their meaning. And they know uh, that uh, it's... Um, uh, difficult to communicate mm. uh, these kind of meanings. The, uh, the societies are complicated. Uh, you know, it takes 40 years to learn all of the songs and things like that. But that's why you only have been very careful at documenting mm. their paintings. Yeah. And so there's a book that you can get called the Saltwater mm-hmm. Painting mm. Book that was uh, done uh, by Yolngu deliberately mm. uh, to uh, show their rights in uh, the saltwater country, the land, mm. uh, when they discovered it was being threatened by mm. fishermen coming in and not uh, asking for permission or anything like that. Mm. Uh, and these are all uh, 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 very well documented. You can read them, they're uh, translated mm. by Yolngu uh, uh, translated linguists. Yeah. Uh, and so they're making material available. They're also uh, if you probably know about Bangara uh, dance uh, group, well, the uh, two of the leading people uh, there are Yolngu people. So they're again working with uh, groups outside their own um, uh, Eastern Island land to, in different ways, um, engage uh, with uh, wider Australian society and outside. So um, there's lots of information. If you really want to learn more about these paintings, those resources, in a way, have been made available both by Yolngu themselves, Mm -hmm. uh, but also through working with people like me. Um, And uh, one of the reasons they do work with people like me is um, to uh, go out there and tell people about these uh, Mm. kind of things. Um, My Yolngu uh, name, Uh, means kingfish tail because a kingfish flicks its tail from side to side and in dances is throwing spears from side to side not to kill people but (laughs) sending information Mm. and so they say you're going out there like the kingfish tail sending information (laughs) to people so this is uh, this kind of event like this is something that you all know people want to participate in and happen as earlier, Lindsay said about uh, Wongo, Donald Thompson, who collected this bark and spoke into this warrior, a leader, real leader. He's got maybe how many wives? 23. 23. 23 wives. <laughs> 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 to go through that, to collect all the wives, he had to go through Every individual spears, if we take that woman, if we take, then spear coming after him. So he could touch every spear to, to survive before he goes for another wife. That's because of trying to go into another tribe, another tribe, 
another tribe to own them into, into his authority, into his control. That's, what, that's why he was a warrior. So he wanted to bring every tribe on the Irija side on his line, on his back, mm -hmm. to protect his family. And every time he's raising the kids out of those tribes, he's more strong and powerful. Now, lucky Donald Thompson came in and said, Wongo, I want peace, no more fighting, please. Yeah. Because the, um, the Euro European law interfered, interfered into our country by spraying, shooting, mm -hmm. shooting the mob at Gangan, and then put them in a chain, the ladies been chained at Water Island, that's why they get a spear at uh, the policeman. Yeah. Yeah. So for that sake, Donald Sampson came in, I need peace, peace, peace and now so we come together. How we can sort of come together in a, in a, a better manner, way of living. Yeah? Now, it's a message. They are the message to Australia law, Australia government. It's your more, it's you, as your more saying, okay, we're living in our own mm. law foundation, and somewhere in the line, Australian government has to come in and understand mm. where we're staying, living. Mm. How we can sort of, sort of come in like this, put watch and, you know, that type of uh, communication and negotiation agreement. That's what that Donald Thompson was asking for. I need peace and harmony here. How we can sort of stand in a borderline in Australia facing the enemies that uh, enemies are coming into Australia. The type of the peace we was asking. And that's why this one is passing message, okay? We are Australian, you all are here. We better have hand to hand like this, standing for Australia. Okay. Eh? Yeah. That's what that means, yeah. and that's what this one means. Yeah. It's telling our, our background how you can sort of understand where we're coming from. We're not just um, food caterer, we're not just um, people walking from country to country like that. We're sitting in our own mm. identity, identifications no. of the clan. But it's, a, it's a message, mm. really. Mm. And, um, we all know we're not, not the people that is going to get a stick or whip and then whip you off, get away, get lost. We're not like that. We, we are like that. Go, mm. come in. We stay in one place. We share things. Yeah. What's the best way of going forward? That's a type of message. Mm. Eh? I, don't, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to add that just to follow on from what, what one of you just said, is that um, about a dozen works were produced over about one week in 1942 at, in, in um, North East Arnhem Land, because Donald Thompson was sent back by the Commonwealth in 1940, 1941 to, to put together a, a, a guerrilla force to protect Australia's northern shores. So again, another important part of Australia's history, which not, is not sort of widely known. But what, in fact, is the greatest statement out of that period is about a dozen bark paintings that were produced in that week. And it's exactly as, as you were just saying, Wanyupi. It's, it's about this statement about sovereignty. I mean, the irony wasn't lost on them. You know, Donald Thompson came to say you can't kill outsiders anymore, but now he's coming back less than 10 years later and saying, well, actually, if Japanese do land now, you are allowed to spear them. <laughs> So it's, it's, you know, this, these, these were very clever senior statesmen and they were make, you know, and it's all those clans from Blue Mud Bay all produced these, you know, this one, this one, this one here, a couple in the other room, were all made in that context. So mm. if, and I think both for Yolngu and Australians, there's still a, a lot of story in that for people to sort of appreciate mm. and learn. Mm. But like the Saltwater Exhibition, people were making that statement again about their sovereignty in, you know, in 2002 or whenever yep. it was. 
the sad part about that is they still have to do that story. They still have to remind us, um, us all. But it's, it is. It's that clear message. It's that, that mm. power. It's a sovereignty. It's people owning land, having power in that land and, mm. and protecting that land. Mm. Mm. It's a matter of um, the Australian government and coming into to party to have a good negotiation agreement where both of both of government and us have same level of understanding what they're asking for and what we're asking for. I mean, and then we go forward that way. Mm -hmm. I mean. <laughs> Look, I might leave it there. We've, we've heard so much incredible information today from Wanubi, Howard and Lindy. Um, and before we thank our panellists, I'd, I'd just like to say a few formal thank yous to um, our campus partner which is the Australian Indigenous Studies um, at the School of Culture and Communications. Thank you. And um, thanks also to the University's Culture and, and Community Relations Advisory Group, who's um, generously supported today's panel financially. Museum Victoria, I would like to say another thank you to um, Lindy, as well as Melanie Rabitz and Conservator Samantha Hamilton, who have done a lot of um, work on this exhibition, bringing the works to the Potter. Um, and Amanda Morris, our events coordinator, um, who's done a lot of work to bring everyone together today. So thank you, Amanda. Um, but thank you so much to the three of you for being here today, for sharing so generously in all of your information. And particularly, Wanubi, thank you for coming and okay. talking to us ab about yeah. these bark paintings. It's been, yeah, really special. So please join me thanking you. Thank you.